I'm here to read chapter three from Grass-Fed Cattle, How to Produce and Market Natural Beef by Julius Ruchel. And we're on to chapter three. So in the last chapter, we talked about cows and bulls, heifers and bulls, and what aspects of their characteristics we would like to see, which will help us to decide a, which ones to choose in the beginning to begin our farming experience, but also which ones to cull or basically to remove and which ones to keep as time goes on to strengthen the herd and of course to produce meat. So now we're in chapter three, the cattle year on grass. And I think this is a fairly long one because this is the last chapter I read the first time months ago and yeah this one is long I think no way to get through it in an hour so maybe I'll have like a stopping point we'll do like part two of three all right the cattle year on grass every aspect of a wild herd's yearly life cycle is synchronized to nature's seasonal rhythm maintaining this careful balance allows these animals to thrive without feed mills fertilizer plants and calving barns nature therefore is the perfect model for a cattle management program Working in concert with the seasons allows cattle to lie, live profitably off the land year-round without great off-farm input and supplemental feed expenditures. To achieve a natural system of management, we must study a year in the life of a grassland cow to understand her nutritional needs over time and the various demands of a growing calf's developmental stages. In this chapter, we will examine the cow's digestive process and learn how cow metabolism responds to the seasons. We will also learn how to match the cattle's needs with the changing supply and quality of grass over the course of the year. Studying the once thriving wild herds of bison, wildebeest, deer, moose, and caribou, whose yearly life cycles were in sync with nature's rigorous seasons, is key in this process. The calving season and predator exposure. Calving season in the wild is a giant all-you-can-eat smorgasbord for predators. Yeah, this chapter is pretty fascinating, not gonna lie. Females are vulnerable when pregnant or with newborn offspring underfoot and young prey animals are easy to catch. To reduce their individual vulnerability, all prey animals give birth at the same time. This enormous flood of newborns directly follows the beginning of the spring grass flush or the return of rains that revive the grasses in tropical regions. Because the calving seasons of the various prey animals overlap, newborns are so abundant that predators simply cannot eat all of them. Therefore, an individual calf's risk of predation is significantly reduced. Any animal that calves before or after this brief window of opportunity becomes a target for the hungry predator. Isn't that so interesting? Explains so much about cows, I guess. And just the fact that, that all happens that way and it's like a giant sacrifice. They have to they have to sacrifice um some children because predators go for the the small kid targets it's just easier and safer to do um if cows calve before the green grass returns when food is still scarce calves will be targeted heavily by predators but when the calving season is in sync with the birthing season of mice deer moose ducks and rabbits the calves guarded as they are by the protective 1200 pound mothers in close proximity to humans no longer look very attractive to the hungry wolf or coyote. There is a vast abundance of prey that are easier to catch. By the time the predator's food supply becomes scarce, the calves are already quite big, strong, and fast, and are far less attractive than many other wild prey species. Incidentally, this smorgasbord of newborns in the late spring also dictates when predators give birth. Their young, which are usually quite uncoordinated and incapable of hunting and traveling with their parents until they are several months old, are born several months before the green grass arrives, so they are strong enough to begin their hunting lessons when the greatest abundance of newborn prey animals is available. The calf, birth to sexual development. Calves born on lush green grass during warm weather in late spring and early summer are not as shocked by the change in temperature when they emerge from the warmth of the cow's uterus as they would be in winter. If nature intended winter births, calves would be born with much more and thicker hair rather than a light hair coat appropriate to the summer weather. Likewise, when the weather, grass, weather and grass conditions are most favorable, they have the best chance to get up, 
become strong, and quickly join the herd without the hindrance of dust, mud, drought, cold, or snow. The clean grass of this time does not expose the calf's delicate navel to the risk of infection, and bacteria and diseases have the least opportunity to attack the animal's immune system. Conditions ensure that the calf's footing is secure if it has to outrun predators and provide plenty of tall grass to hide behind during the first vulnerable days of the calf's life. And it's all about weather and time of year. A calf must respond quickly to its mother's promptings to stand so it can bond with her, drink its first colostrum, and quickly gain sufficient strength to follow the herd. Remaining within the safe confines of the herd is imperative to a calf's survival, but the herd is constantly moving. The mother cannot afford to protect a weak calf for any great length of time and be left behind means certain death. By calving at the time of year when grass is lush and nutrient rich, the cow ensures that her colostrum is the best possible quality. Colostrum provides a concentrated dose of essential nutrients and energy required by the calf to recover from the ordeals of birth, to activate the cow's digestive processes, and to gain strength quickly. It also transfers a cow's disease immunity to the calf, so the calf will be protected until its own immune system is strong enough to take over in the next few months. Colostrum production lasts only a brief time. Within 24 hours, the udder stops making it and starts producing milk. Warm weather helps ensure that the calf can take full advantage of the short colostrum production window. Without it, the calf will grow up to be a runt if disease, starvation, or a wolf doesn't kill it first. There's a picture here of a mom licking the behind of a calf, and it's a calf responds to its mother's promptings to stand. So she's like, get up, we gotta go. Oh my god, isn't this fascinating? Rumination and the immune system. The newborn calf lives exclusively on its mother's milk during the first weeks of life. Within a month after birth, the calf's rumen, first stomach chamber, becomes active and the calf begins to supplement its mother's milk with its first mouthfuls of grass. As luck would have it, the second flush of grass growth, which typically follows the most intense summer heat, excuse me, has just started by this time, <clears throat> so there is plenty of tender grass available to stimulate the calf's small, delicate mouth and rumen. By early fall, the calf will be strong enough to deal with the dry, coarse, leftover grass that it will have to survive on through the upcoming winter or drought season. The precise timing of these developmental milestones works to the calf's advantage. As opposed to the early spring or late winter calving customary in the conventional beef industry, it is best to match calving in this natural schedule. To this natural schedule, rather. Like, duh. When the calf is three months old, the immunity offered by colostrum wears off and the calf's own immune system kicks in. Luckily, the weather is still warm and dry and there's plenty of good grass. The winter or drought season has not yet begun, so the calf easily makes this transition. The calf is growing vigorously at this age and its cells are multiplying rapidly. Although the calf is not yet gaining fat, it is forming empty fat cells within the fibers of its muscles, which will fill in later during its final growth phase at the end of adolescence, known as the finishing stage because it is the last stage of bringing an animal to its desired fat level and slaughter weight for market. The calf reaches 45% of its mature body weight just as the grass becomes dormant at the onset of winter, or at the beginning of the drought season. This marks the beginning of the calf's sexual development. It is becoming a teenager. If the calf grows too fast during this stage, fat cells will form in areas where the body form in areas of the body where they will harm sexual development. In the wild, the onset of winter and scarce food supply prevent the calf from gaining weight too rapidly during this growth stage. The calf is still suckling its mother's milk at this time and it will not be weaned until winter is almost over, though the exact time when a cow kicks away her calf depends on how much of her fat reserves have been depleted during the winter. Bypass protein, the advantages of suckling. When a calf sucks milk from its mother's teats with its head held in that funny upward kink that allows it to reach her udder, a wonderful thing happens. Oh, this is awesome. The combination of sucking, the position of the calf's head, and the stimulation of the warm milk causes the esophageal groove to form in the calf's digestive system, which allows the milk to bypass the rumen and go directly to the second stomach chamber in a process called esophageal groove closure. The rumen contains bacteria that ferment and break down the tough cellulose structure of grass, but these bacteria feed on proteins, including milk protein, that enter the rumen. 
only protein excesses and the proteins released by the rumen bacteria after they die are passed on to the second stomach chamber where they will become available to the cow. Suckling allows milk to bypass these bacteria so that all of the milk's protein is available to the calf. When the milk is fed to a calf from a bucket because the calf does not receive the full combination of stimuli, full esophageal closure often does not occur. Consequently, a large percentage of the milk's protein is lost to the rumen bacteria. Wow. And there's photos down here at the bottom that show this. Um, and I'm sure smart farmers that don't have them suckle even will put, put milk like in an upward position or something, right? They must know this by now. By the time winter arrives, the cow's milk production has dropped off considerably. The little milk still available to the suckling calf allows just enough milk protein to bypass the rumen so the calf can continue growing and developing sexually during the winter season without the extra burst of protein. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Without this extra burst of protein, a calf's sexual development will be compromised. The male and female calves developmental paths diverge during this time period. Cows grow up fast. The heifer calf, sexual development to calving. During the sexual development stage, the heifer's future fertility and reproductive functions are determined. The hormones responsible for the development of her ovaries and mammary tissue are soluble in fat. If the heifer gains weight too quickly, such as on a high grain diet in a feedlot, she will continue to form fat cells throughout her sexual development, which will absorb some of these important hormones, preventing them from reaching their intended destination in the ovaries and mammary tissue. As such, Fewer DNA-containing cells with the genes responsible for fertility and milk production will be formed. Although the heifer must continue to gain enough weight to guarantee healthy sexual development, the more fat cells she develops during this stage, the less fertile she will be and the less milk she will produce for her calves. A delicate balance must be struck between healthy and unhealthy weight gain. This stage of a heifer's sexual development ends when she reaches 65% of her mature body weight, ideally with the arrival of spring. This is also when she has her first estrus cycle at approximately 10 months of age. Her mammary tissues are completely formed by now, so further fat development will not affect her future milk production. As grass becomes plentiful again, the heifer starts filling all the fat cells within her muscle fibers, which she formed earlier in her life. She accumulates as much fat as possible during the summer months to help her through the next winter. At the end of summer, she becomes fertile in time for the first breeding season in the 14th month of her life. The fertile, low-maintenance heifer discussed in Chapter 2 conceives at this time and begins her first pregnancy. The typical term of a cow or heifer's gestation <coughs> excuse me, is 280 days, slightly longer if you are calving out of sync with nature's seasons, as is discussed in Calving to Breeding on page 40. The calf growing inside her will not require a significant portion of her nutrients until it reaches its last trimester. She survives winter by reabsorbing the previous summer's fat reserves to supplement the season's scarce food supply. In the final three months of her pregnancy, her nutritional requirements increase significantly. Because calving season doesn't start until after the new grass begins to grow, she has enough time to replenish her fat reserves and finish her pregnancy on a nutrient-rich diet. Mm -hmm. Fat reserves for the drought season. A grazing animal's fat cells exist not just to keep the animal warm during winter or to make a predator's meal tastier, but also to serve as cold cellars and grain bins, rather, also to serve as cold cellars and grain bins serve humans. They are storage facilities to help ration last year's harvest until the next season's harvest begins. Right? And we also have our own fat stores. All animals in the wild. It is key to remember, though, as we go through this, that um, it's fascinating the similarities and differences between us, but there are absolutely differences. Um, these cows are like, what are they, right? They're, they have a year, basically, and I was just thinking about this as I was reading. The... The cow's life is food. It's about eating. It, you are grazing. That is a freaking lifestyle, right? Cows are obsessed with food, and they're 
when they're together, they get competitive and they eat as much as they can. And it's basically this race to eat. You want the qualities of a good eater. And that is like their job, first and foremost. <clears throat> so cows are obsessed with food. Those types of plant foods where they have to eat, it's very low nutrient. That is like a technical term, literally. Um, plant food like grass is very, very low nutrient. In fact, the cow doesn't really digest it at all, right? It goes through those four stomachs, which I'm sure will be covered shortly. So it's really just a, a world of bacteria and um, microorganisms that break down the cellulose, the fiber, and they ferment it. So it's kind of being completely outsourced by a whole other civilization. Not that ours is completely different because we also have a, an incredibly complex 100 trillion microbes in our gut, but it's nothing like a cow. Their whole life is dedicated to eating and eating well. And that is in strict contrast to really what is a carnivore's lifestyle, which is, and this, this affects even the way you think about food when you are eating it, is it's life is not about food food is like this celebration when you get it but first and foremost you're not thinking about food you're thinking about <clears throat> how to get food it's like this whole plan that must be orchestrated and it can seem like a really melodramatic affair like pulling you know salting meat <laughs> leaving it in the fridge for a day pulling it out but it becomes kind of a ritual because it's like it's that process of getting the nutrients it's just like it's it's the next level above you're higher on the food chain life is a little more complex so like yes we both have fat reserves but the way in which they develop them and their purpose it's 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 a little different they're all in these cycles Human fat stores are more about getting through lean times. The life of a predator is uncertain. We go through f for, you know, we are built to go without food for long periods of time if we have to. And part of that is that we keep fat stores on us in contrast to even other great apes who have like 1% or 2% fat. A healthy human being has like 10% fat or more. And so we are always a little fat which is great because it means that we can use those fat stores. So we have this kind of on the go reserve thing and the cows basically have this whole system that's built into the seasons where they know they're going to deplete a ton because the grass won't be available. Well, you know, grass may not be as available, but cows still are. So there are going to be predators in winter too. Fat reserves for the drought season. Here we go. A grazing animal's fat cells exist not just to keep the animal warm during winter or to make a predator's meal tastier, but also to serve as cold cellars and grain bin as grain. <laughs> ah, that one got me again. But also to serve as cold cellars and grain bins serve humans. There's a break in the line, you know, when you have to like skip down to the next line at the wrong point. They are storage facilities to help ration last year's harvest until next season's <clears throat> harvest begins. All animals in the wild survive. All animals in the wild survive the winter or drought season by reabsorbing the fat inside their fat cells to supplement their lean diet. Although a cow can still find some grass baking under the sun or lying brown and frozen under the snow, without her fat reserves, she would not be able to meet all of her nutritional requirements and would abort her calf to ensure her survival. When we calve out of season, we have to supplement our cow's nutrition during winter to provide the cow for calving. Without expensive feed supplementation, the calves development and the cows fertility would be compromised. These extra food supplements require money, fuel, time, and labor to grow, to grow, harvest, and feed, thereby seriously compromising our profit margin. When our calving season corresponds to summer grass growth, the cow can comfortably supplement her winter grass intake with her fat reserves, allowing her body weight to fluctuate by as much as 150 pounds or even more over the course of the year, because her nutrient requirements will not peak until after the end of winter. In this way, she has still enough time on lush spring grass, 
to refill her fat cells and regain the body condition required to maintain her fertility before her calf is born. Certainly it takes a lot of grass to fatten an animal every year, but because grass is usually in excess during the spring flush and the cow does all the harvesting for you, the extra grass is essentially free. There's a little extra section chart, not chart, but um, one of those side paragraph thingies. A lesson in compensatory gain. During the scarcity of the winter season, the cow's body slows its metabolic rate in an effort to conserve energy and reduce nutritional demands to ensure survival. When the green grass finally arrives in spring, her body still has a very slow me metabolic rate, and it takes some time for her metabolism to speed up again. Until then, her body is able to gain weight with tremendous efficiency. This is super important. Th this is like, this is one of those things that you would just not know about to do with cows and then you know it and you're like holy shit this is like how the whole thing works i'm going to start over a lesson in compensatory gain so it's all about metabolism and basically before we get into this feeding the cow at the time when its metabolism is slow so it can gain weight quickly does that make sense when its metabolism is going at a, at a good rate um it's harder for the cow to gain weight it's also an important healthy point in the cow's life when things are good but yes when the metabolism is moving slower you can fatten your cow a lot easier okay during the scarcity of the winter season the cow's body slows its metabolic rate in an effort to conserve energy and reduce nutritional demands to ensure survival when the green grass finally arrives in spring, her body still has a very slow metabolic rate, and it takes some time for her metabolism to speed up again. Until then, her body is able to gain weight with tremendous efficiency. This compensatory gain allows animals to quickly make up for food shortages and even catch up to those that didn't experience such a shortage. Compensatory gain helps to ensure a cow's fertility for next season by fattening her up quickly before lactation begins. Once her calf is born, the high demands of milk production prevent her from gaining any more weight, which is why the calving season has to be timed to occur after the grass greens up, not with the beginning of the spring grass flush. Compensatory gain also allows growing cattle to use fewer calories to reach the same finished carcass weight at the, in the same time frame as growing cattle whose metabolism remained unchanged during their entire growth due to access to constant feed supply. Thus, you can winter calves very cheaply and still make up for it the following summer. The cow's fat reserves ensure that calves, with the help of their mother's milk, can continue gaining sufficiently for their sexual development. Incidentally, compensatory gain is the reason why so many human diet programs don't work. When the food supply is rationed, our bodies compensate by slowing our metabolic rate following a natural survival mechanism. Once we have lost the desired weight and stop rationing, we experience compensatory gain until our metabolism catches up. In the meantime, we regain all of the weight. That's exactly well, exactly put, well put. It's exactly well put is what it is, Julius Rochelle. That is a process we share. And in the life of a cow, it, it works quite differently because your metabolism in a human being does not slow when you don't eat when it slows is when you eat small amounts and certain types of food um, like carbs and stuff in small amounts i.e. In, in low starving situations and then yes your body will just say okay um, clearly we're in a situation where it would help to slow metabolism so we will slow but generally if our food is fat, animal fat based especially but fat based metabolic state in ketosis <clears throat> the body is just assuming that things are good even if you don't eat for several days your metabolism actually up regulates in a fast like three days into a fast you're burning super because what your body assumes is happening is that you need to be opting um, functioning optimally to get that food right you the, the tribe does not make a kill every day generally it is fully expected that we will go with some time without food. Your body can't take that as a time to slow down because slowing your metabolism weakens you. We need to be working at full capacity. 
so it's a it's like a different balance it's all about how you are like you just got to do life correct with these cows right you got to like put them through the cycles that make sense and suddenly everything works out and it works out financially because you're feeding them this grass and you're like oh like someone might be like oh no it's winter they're losing weight but whoa hold on their metabolism is also slowing during that period which means once the grasses are growing in spring again they will be able to gain weight so much quicker and so you could have saved yourself all the hassle of like giving them a bunch of grain feed and like bringing you know buying extra food to make them fat you're just doing it wrong when you're talking about a cow because you're thinking of yourself as a human right we want to we're always trying to get food right that's our whole mission in life it's like do i have food well no i should be thinking about how i might get some of that so yeah even in the winter we're going to be like how can i get food and so we're applying that value to these cows cows have different values cow values good body condition and fertility fertility is strongly influenced by the cow's body condition called the body condition score or bcs at the time of calving not at the time of breeding the following illustrates how a cow's body condition score at the time of calving influences her probability of conception at the time of breeding, provided that all other variables in this example, that is, health, genetics, access to a balanced mineral supplement, etc., remain consistent. A BCS of 7 at calving equals a 90% or greater probability of conception at breeding. BCS of 6, 75%. BCS of 5, 50% probability of conception at breeding. BCS of 4 at calving. 25 to 30 percent probability and a bcs of seven or greater um wait a bcs of seven or greater equals a decline in the cow's fertility as her obesity impedes her reproductive functions okay so a cow's reproductive system can recover quickly after calving only if her fat reserves are replenished before calving she has to replenish them after the high demands of lactation begin. She will not have enough nutritional stores left to rebuild her reproductive system in time for her next pregnancy. The nutritional demands of the current calf take priority over a future pregnancy if the cow's body is not fat enough for both at calving. If a long winter or late rains prevent a cow's body condition from recovering fully before calving, good nutrition after calving will not speed the recovery of her reproductive system in time for the upcoming breeding season. Even if she is able to recover all of her body condition in time for breeding, she simply cannot absorb enough nutrients, even on the best possible diet, to simultaneously replenish her fat cells, produce milk, and prepare her reproductive tract for breeding. In such a case, fertility is always priority number three. This is why the time interval between the season's first grass growth and the onset of calving is so important. It gives a cow a chance to replenish her fat cells prior to calving to ensure her fertility in the upcoming breeding season. The cycle. If a food shortage prevents a cow from regaining her full body condition before calving, the high demands of lactation will jeopardize her survival in the coming winter if she becomes pregnant again. Nature compensates for this risk by reducing her fertility until after she has fulfilled her responsibilities to her current calf. If her survival continues to be threatened during the next winter, her milk supply will dry up sooner to conserve nutrition and energy for herself at the expense of her current calf. <clears throat> so nature is actually reducing her fertility, but with a good purpose. Body condition scoring. The BCS is a standard by which we can monitor our cow's body conditions as they fluctuate over the course of the year, allowing us to maximize our cattle's compensatory gains, minimize their feed supplements during winter, and still know when to intervene if fluctuating body condition threatens to affect fertility levels in the next breeding season. The nine-point BCS is summarized in the following chart. A cow has ideal fat cover when her BCS fluctuates between 5 and 7 during the year. Cows should regain a BCS of 7 just prior to calving to ensure maximum fertility at breeding, a measure she can safely regain if she does not drop below a BCS of 5 during winter and if we assume there is enough time between the beginning of the spring grass flush and calving. A BCS of 4 is the borderline between good health and malnutrition. If she drops below that, she will begin 
begin to damage body tissues, which heal much more slowly than she could replenish with her fat cells. She will be unlikely to return to a BCS of 7 prior to calving, but even if she does, her fertility will be compromised during the next breeding season because it takes time to heal malnourished body tissues after extreme weight loss. By monitoring BCS throughout the year, we are not surprised by the condition of our cattle at breeding time. If the cattle slim down too rapidly and we can predict that they will reach a borderline BCS before spring grass returns, we can intervene by weaning early, increasing their access to pasture, administering feeding supplements to compensate for protein or energy deficiencies in the grass supply, and avoiding pastures that have a low nutrient value. We can also separately supplement higher maintenance animals such as first calf heifers and coal high maintenance cows and heifers that lose body condition more quickly than the rest of the herd or record their numbers for culling at a later date. So there's a massive chart here with uh, the BCS stuff, which we'll go through. Body conditioning score, BCS. So a number one, this cow is like dead. The bones, ribs, and spine of the cow are visible and there's no fat anywhere on the body. The muscles are atrophied and the cow is physically weak and has difficulty walking and standing. Two, the cow has all the above characteristics but can still walk and stand. 3. Similar to a BCS of 1 or 2, but muscles are visible and not atrophied to the same degree. Ribs and spine protrude. There is no fat on the body. See illustration. A BCS of 3 re represents approximately 13% body fat. An average sized cow with a BCS of 3 is approximately 350 pounds lighter than the same cow with a BCS of 7. That's like all fat. Number four, the bones and three to five ribs are visible, but the spine is less pronounced. Individual muscles in the hindquarters are visible. There is no visible fat. A BCS of four represents approximately 18% body fat. An average sized cow with a BCS of four is about 270 pounds lighter than a cow with a BCS of seven. Slightly fatter than a cow with a BCS of four is a number five. Only one or two ribs are visible. Hindquarter muscles aren't distinguishable. A small amount of fat cover can be felt over her pin bones, but there is no fat in her brisket. See illustration. A BCS of 5 represents approximately 22% body fat. An average sized cow with a BCS of 5 is approximately 100 pounds lighter than the same cow with a BCS of 7. No fat in her brisket. So if you have a good fatty brisket, you know you got a good cow, I guess. Number 6. The cow begins to show some fat in her brisket and flanks, and her ribs are no longer visible. Her pin bones and hips are still visible, but her body has a smooth appearance. A BCS of 6 represents approximately 26.5% body fat, which is approximately 90 pounds lighter than the same cow with a BCS of 7. We're really going for a 7 here. Wait, we want 7. The cow's brisket and flanks are full of fat in a 7, and the indent of the spine is visible on the cow's back, which is square with fat. The outline, we want that square fat look. Though they are still visible, see illustration, a BCS of 7 represents approximately 31% body fat. And calorically, that would mean you have about equal protein and fat. 31% fat and about 60 odd, well, you'd have about 69% protein. And calorically, that would work out to being like slightly more calories from fat, I think. Um, Eight. The cow is so fat that her pin bones and hips aren't visible and the brisket is distended. The udder begins to show fat and there are patchy fat deposits around the tail head. Her neck is extremely thick and the indent of the spinal cord is quite pronounced. A BCS of eight re represents approximately 35.5% body fat. And a nine, the cow's fat cover is even heavier than a BCS of eight. Her udder is fat and fat protrudes from the tail head and over her pin bones. Right on. Right. From calving to breeding. Calving on grass after the beginning of the growing season, late spring or early summer. Actually, no. Before I get into this, another one of these long subsections. We will be calling them subsections from now on. A 21 day breeding cycle. Nature's breeding seasons put our 42, 42 day breeding seasons to shame. Nature's breeding seasons put our 42-day breeding seasons to shame. And by we, he's saying normal cow farmers, people, cow farmers. They usually have a 42 breeding season, i.e. there's 42 days out of the year where calves can be born, basically. 
Wild breeding seasons are extremely short to accommodate the very brief window of opportunity that maximizes ideal calving conditions and minimizes the nutritional cost of surviving the winter in good health and high fertility. And all those predators, right? Calving any earlier or any later significantly increases the risk of predation, disease, pressure, parasite loads, starvation, and decreased fertility. This brief window of opportunity becomes even more tightly constrained in more northern climate in northern climes, resulting in very short breeding season that may be shorter than the duration of one full estrus cycle. The estrus cycle of breeding females actually becomes synchronized to the brief rut, the annual time period when bulls rams and so forth are excited and are physiologically and behaviorally capable of reproduction sperm are produced it occurs during the breeding season in the same time frame as the estrus cycle its female equivalent the moose rut in alaska's denali national park which i've witnessed lasts less than two weeks during that time the moose world breaks into complete pandemonium as hundreds of moose congregate in a single giant valley to participate in a massive free-for-all mating frenzy Bull moose cruise up and down the valley, bogling and challenging one another, blinded by their sexual frenzy and oblivious to everything except each other and the scent of their cows. Trees, cars, and tourists become invisible to them as they crash around to meet their tight two-week deadline. It is a spectacular commotion, but at the end of the two weeks, the moose have left the valley and peace returns. Mimicking Nature's Cycles couldn't we mimic the wild herd's single estrus 21-day breeding cycle in our domestic cattle herds? In fact, this begins to happen naturally in our herds after we adopt a calving season that is in sync with nature's seasons. See chapter 23 for a detailed guide on how to time your calving seasons to your farm's climate and season. And adopt a rigorous selection and culling process based on fertility and maintenance characteristics. See chapter 2 for a detailed discussion about selection characteristics and culling, removing from the herd. Remember, stress from nutrition, climate, environment, management, etc., and poor genetics cause decreased fertility, increased recovery periods following calving, and poor conception rates. The most fertile, low-maintenance cows always recover their estrus cycles most quickly after calving and therefore rebreed first. After several years of managing your herd according to nature's rhythms and selection characteristics, you will notice that an ever-increasing majority of cows will calve during the first half of your 42-day calving season, corresponding to the cow's first estrus cycle of the previous breeding season. This happens as a result of removing the added stress of calving out of sync with nature's seasons and increasing the number of fertile, low-maintenance animals in the herd through your culling program and replacement heifer selection process. The decreasing numbers of cows that continue to calve during the second half of the calving season are physiologically the least fertile and highest maintenance cows in the herd. You ultimately want to remove them from the herd anyway. Over time, this remaining number of less fertile, higher maintenance cows will become small enough that you can shorten your breeding season to 21 days, eliminating these animals from the herd without significantly affecting your conception rates and financial income. This can be done either gradually or within a single breeding season. By recording the number of cows calving on each day of the calving seasons and their years prior to the shortening the calving seasons from 42 to 21 days, you can see exactly how many cows will fail to conceive in the first year of a shortened breeding program simply by looking at how many cows calved during the second half of the calving seasons prior to the switch. In this way, you will not be surprised by the sudden drop in conception rates in the first year of your shortened calving season. You can plan your finances accordingly if you plan a switch while a significant portion of your herd is still calving during the second half of the calving season. These late calvers are the less fertile, high maintenance cows in the herd which take longer to conceive each year. Once they are removed from the herd by the switch, conception rates will return to, return to normal or even improve slightly. In the long term, this dramatically shortens the calving season, makes your grazing management easier, and produces a more uniform calf crop. It also prevents subfertile and high maintenance animals from rebreeding so the genetics do not enter the herd. A 21 day breeding cycle works particularly well on the replacement heifers, helping you to select only the most fertile heifers to contribute to your herd's genetics. See rebreeding and first calf heifer on page 44. A word of warning, however, switching the main cow herd to a 21 day breeding cycle is advisable only after all other parts of the cattle production year have been fine tuned to mesh with the most efficient seasonal rhythm and you have recorded all of your cows calving dates for several calving seasons prior to making the switch to ensure that both your herd and business planning are prepared for the first year of a 21 day breeding season. A 21 day breeding cycle needs to be laid on a very stable foundation or it will topple your production tower.
fascinating. So it's like you can gauge basically the quality and the efficiency of your herd through this breeding cycle because ultimately that's what it's all about right it's the re true purpose of life is to make more so if they're doing that well and they can do it efficiently and as they would do in the wild cows are badass from calving to breeding calving on grass after the beginning of the growing season late spring or early summer is highly advan advantageous for the cow it is the most favorable time of year for her to face the stress of labor. Meet her high nutritional needs of her calf. Where are we on time? 40, okay. And prepare for rebreeding. She is well fed. The grass is full of nutrients and vitamins. She does not have to cope with the adverse conditions of winter weather, predator pressure at its lowest, and water is abundant. On such a calving schedule, the cow's gestation period is a few days shorter than that of a cow calving during the f winter months. 280 days versus 285 days. Perhaps the warm weather and the cow's good health, health help her relax and come into labor sooner. During this time of year, calves' birth weights are lower and the cows have significantly fewer calving difficulties. Plenty, um, so the cow, the calves' weights are lower um, being a good thing because they can give birth to them easier. And it, if everything is timed right and the cycle's right, then they'll have plenty of time to get the um, the calves weight up so plenty of space in a relatively stress-free environment allow the cows to concentrate on their new mothering duties as a result their maternal instincts are stronger than if they calve out of season the favorable conditions and absence of stress also speed the recovery of the cow's reproductive tract after calving allowing her to begin her fertile estrus cycle sooner and have more cleansing cycles prior to breeding and thus increase the likelihood of conception at breeding time this inevitably increases the percentage of cows bred during the first cycle of being exposed to the bull. In addition, the low stress combination of calving on grass and allowing a cow's body to con condition to fluctuate with the seasons extends their life so you will need fewer replacement heifers each year. Calving on grass and good genetic selection practices virtually eliminate calving difficulties, calf mortality, calf disease, and calving related deaths. It's almost like when you when you run a species in a way that is contrary to their millions of years of evolution, they have issues. Instead of playing night watchman, nanny, and veterinarian for the entire calving season, you can essentially turn your back on the herd and focus on grazing management, marketing, and your profit margin. Because now you have time to do so. After calving, the cow's physiology changes dramatically as the bulk of her nutritional intake is redirected from replenishing her fat reserves to meeting the high demands of lactation. In addition, her body prepares for rebreeding. Following a brief period of infertility, her estrous cycles return each successive cycle before breeding, allowing her body to further cleanse and rebalance itself, making her more fertile and better prepared for her last or better prepared for her next pregnancy. Um, so I was just thinking about cows and in, was it the last chapter, the one before they were saying, uh, I think it was the first one where they were talking about how cows evolved uh, wild cattle about 5.3 million years ago, the same time as us. Human beings and cows, we are made for each other. like you cannot underestimate that because we evolve together we are we are our cattle eaters steak literally made as human being like it was basically some apes got access to cows because cows evolved so it was like just like the yeah, we're just following in their wake. We're just following the cow. We've been following the cow our entire existence. Late calving cows have less time to cleanse and rebalance before being exposed to the bull, so they are less fertile. In a 60-day breeding season, three estrus cycles, the last cow to calve has only one cleansing cycle after calving before the breeding season begins, whereas the early calving cows will have at least three cleansing cycles. In a 
42 day breeding season uh, two estrus cycles the last cow to calve will have an additional estrus cycle during which to recover before being exposed to the bull allowing her two cleansing cycles prior to breeding by shortening the breeding season to 42 days every cow in the herd has a similar opportunity to regain fertility after calving in the long term after subfertile animals are cold a short breeding season improves overall conception rates conception rates during the first cycle of the breeding season and overall herd health photo period sunlight and fertility the photo period the interval of the 24-hour day during which an organism is exposed to the light is one of nature's most powerful triggers in the wild influencing migrations and breeding activity the farther an animal lives from the equator the more pronounced the effects because animals have evolved to use the variations in day length to time their life cycles to the dramatic seasonal variations they experience at these latitudes in lower latitudes the effect is less pronounced there is less daylight variation and less dramatic variation between seasonal extremes and seasonal variations in climate are influenced little by day length. Sexual activity and breeding tend to peak during the equinoxes, so calving occurs during the grass flush around the summer solstice, even the acyclic period, a cow's infertile period after calving, is significantly shorter when calving occurs around the summer solstice. Day length is such a powerful trigger that many wild animals, and even domestic cattle, go through a false rut at the spring equinox when the number of daylight hours equals those of the fall equinox, although the bull's dominance challenges never quite reach the same intensity as during the fall rut, hence the term spring fever. The powerful combination of increased sexual hormones at the equinoxes, a shorter acyclic period when a cow calves close to the summer solstice, and body conditions that peak on the spring grass flush just before calving helps to guarantee that nature's prey animals are born when the grass is greenest and they have the highest chance of survival. The effect of photo period is less pronounced in tropical latitudes, resulting in longer calving seasons that revolve around the cycles of the rainy drought seasons rather than the photo period. Humans are not exempt from the effects of photo period. Anyone who's lived in the far north can testify to the dramatic fluctuations in energy and t cheerfulness as day lengths change between summer and winter. I wonder if that's partly tied to food, though. I'd be curious on that. Like, um, I'm sure people's ability to deal with these cycles, because, because when you're thinking like basically when you're being fed like a hunter at that point, like your life, it's always one long mission to get food. Like always one long like. So I would imagine that those foods would propel you, frankly, through periods of like long, longer, dark, and cold winters. In fact, winter carnivals were invented in northern latitudes to counteract depression caused by the limited daylight. And possibly bread? I'm not sure. The powerful effect of photo period is well known in agricultural sectors. The chicken industry manipulates photo period by keeping on the lights in egg-laying barns to increase egg production. Dairy producers use the lights in their dairy barns to stimu simulate longer days, thereby maintaining a higher level of milk production, probably at the expense to the cow. Although less well-known, cattle fertility, estrus cycles, and libido are also profoundly affected by photo period. The closer a cow calves to the summer solstice, the shorter is her acyclic period before her estrus cycles re recommence. For example, at 40 degrees latitude, a cow with a BCS of 6 will have an acyclic period of 34 days if she calves in July. If the same cow calves in January at the same latitude, however, her acyclic period could last as long as 75 days. In more northern latitudes, this photo period effect becomes even more pronounced. Calves are influenced by the photo period of their birth date. Heifers born around the summer solstice will begin their first estrus cycles at a much younger age than heifers born earlier or later in the year. This in turn influences their fertility and conception rates during their first and second breeding seasons because they will have had more cleaning estrus cycles prior to their first pregnancies. If we continue, consider if we consider how dramatically photo period affects acyclic periods after calving, it is not surprising that the calving season for cattle left on their own will naturally shift to coincide with the summer solstice and the calving seasons of animals in the wild. When combined, photo period and BCS at calving have an even more dramatic effect on breeding season fertility con and conception rates. The child, <laughs> the child, the chart on page 43, the next page, illustrates the combined effect of photo period and BCS at calving on conception rates 
85 days after calving. As you move further from the equator, the combined effect increases, while closer to the equator, the effect of photo period weakens until it is overridden by the effect of body condition, which fluctuates in response to rainy seasons, grass growth, and drought cycles. This is a long chart, um, so take a look. It's really um, probably pretty important information that I will not read. Synchronizing estrus cycles. See, this is a long chapter, so we're going to break up pretty soon, I think, and I will read in the next section, the second half. Synchronizing estrus cycles. When cows are exposed to a bull, his presence synchronizes the cows by triggering their estrus cycles and also shortens the infertile period between calving and their first cycle. Oh, interesting. So the presence of a bull can trigger the estrus cycles and their synchronicity. This is nature's way to ensure that no cow misses the opportunity presented by the bull's arrival. Now keep in mind that unlike humans, cows and, and um, cattle rather, they have these windows of breeding, very short windows of time. Uh, synchronizing a cow herd can be very useful in emergency situations in which you suspect fertility may be compromised by a less than ideal BCS prior to calving. It is also a powerful tool to help shift your breeding season to an earlier date, for example from fall calving to early summer calving, or if you want to gear your cows to a shorter breeding season. It's quite difficult to put a dollar value on the extra benefits of raising your own replace replacement heifers. Got that? There are several, it'll come up again. That was a side quote. There are several, several natural alternatives to veterinary methods of synchronization. Several alternative, there are several nat natural alternatives to veterinary methods of synchronization. Ugh. 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 Flushing is a method <clears throat> of stimulating estrus in which the cows receive a sudden and dramatic increase in their energy and protein intake in the week before breeding either by being turned into a particularly lush, fresh pasture, or by receiving a feed supplement. A word of caution. When using flushing pastures to stimulate estrus, note that the high estrogen content of some clovers and alfalfas can actually inhibit the estrus cycle and decrease conception rates. Yes, because plants are fighting cows too. They're gonna like use the same chemicals they'd use on other things. Um, many plants will bind in certain ways, basically increase your estrogen. That's often a fighter, a weapon that plants use is increasing your estrogen. Like bread, for instance, or beer, um, the hops, and they have basically, I forget what the word, the technical word is, but they're going to use estrogen against you and make you estro more estrogenetic. And cows are... Uh, way better at fighting plants than we are but they can still be effective and that's why being a good eater being a smart aggressive eater as a cow is that's their life a more common method is to send a vasectomized sterile bull out into the cow herd the presence of a bull on the opposite side of a very secure fence will have a similar effect as long as the cows can see, smell, and interact with him without being bred. Short duration, weaning, removing the young calves from their mothers for 24 hours just prior to breeding season. That's so funny, the idea of them on the other sides of the fence, like, like chatting, it's like chatting them up. Um, short duration weaning, removing the young calves from their mothers for 24 hours just prior to breeding season will also synchronize the cow herd. Though it is tremendously stressful for all involved, intense stress tends to trigger the estrus cycle. Sounds like maybe not the best method. This adaptation allows a cow whose calf dies or is physically separated from her to become fertile quickly so she can increase her chances of another successful pregnancy. A lion will kill cubs that are not his own so he can stimulate the lioness to breed sooner, increasing the likelihood that his genetics will survive. Rebreeding the first calf heifer. When heifers are rebred after their first calving season, they have the lowest conception rates of the entire herd. Because they are still growing when nursing, they are the most nutritionally challenged age group on the farm. 
Some people try to compensate for this by breeding their replacement heifers a bit earlier than the main cow herd to give them more time to recover before being rebred as first calf heifers. This is not advantageous to replacements in the long term because they have less time to develop their reproductive tracts through multiple cleansing cycles prior to being bred the first time. Their conception rates as first calf heifers will not improve significantly and their fertility will remain compromised throughout their life because they were bred prematurely the first time. Another common practice is to wait until replacement heifers are two years old before breeding them the first time. Although this does give a heifer more time to cycle, it is not economical for the farmer and allows the genetics of slow maturing, high maintenance, subfertile females to enter the breeding herd. If a heifer requires two years to become fertile, she is not suited to your management conditions and will not be a low cost, high profit investment. To improve the fertility of first calf heifers, breed replacement heifers at the same time as the main cow herd, but allow them to breed for only the first 21 day cycle. Conception rates will be lower among the replacement heifers due to the short breeding cycle, but this ensures that only the most fertile, most efficient replacement heifers are bred and approximates the natural culling and genetic selection process. After calving, each heifer will be guaranteed a minimum of three estrus cycles to cleanse and rebalance her reproductive tract before being rebred, giving her the best possible advantage during rebreeding as a first calf heifer. During the first winter nursing a calf, First calf heifers are the most vulnerable to malnutrition. Monitor BCS closely and provide supplemental protein if needed to protect them from emaciation and to prevent a drop in their fertility during the next breeding season. Buying versus raising replacement heifers. The economic cost of raising your own replacement heifers can be quite deceiving, particularly if you add the opportunity cost, the missed financial opportunity of not pursuing another more valuable alternative represented by grazing another saleable livestock in their place. During a market low, when herds are typically downsized to cut losses, it is not uncommon for replacement heifers to cost much less to buy than to raise from your own herd when you add up all the hidden expenses. Yet, it is quite difficult to put a dollar value on the extra benefits of raising your own replacement heifers. Their quality is less of a gamble because they are already accustomed to your environment and management conditions. You know their medical histories. They are familiar with your handling practices and the location of your gates. If you practice year-round grazing, they will not need to be taught how to forage for grass under the snow. They will have already mastered the technique as calves in the company of your herd. And they do not need to go through the stress of adjusting to an unfamiliar social hierarchy. A multi-generational herd develops very complex social dynamics, rarely if ever seen in a herd composed of an agglomerate of off-farm replacement animals. Introduced animals can take years to fully integrate into the tightly knit social fabric of the herd and often will continue forming little subgroups along the fringes of the herd for years after they arrive on the farm. In a multi-generational herd, it is not uncommon to find granddaughters, daughters, mothers, and grandmothers consistently grazing together babysitting one another's calves, or simply enjoying each other's company. It's beautiful. Like the migrating caribou herd or the flock of birds that have learned to fly together, the social glue that binds multi-generational herd gives the group a much greater sense of security and tighter connection. Less stress ultimately means a healthier herd, better gains, and a higher profit margin. Let's leave it there. Um, for this, because I'm almost 59 minutes and I will pause and begin a new one immediately so see you in a couple seconds and we're back with the last some odd pages of chapter 3 in grass-fed cattle how to produce and market natural beef by Julius Ruchel so we we're just talking about the advantages of um, raising your own heifers, breeding females, because of their adjustment already to your herd and and how a herd that has multi-generational members in it, you know, they're a real family at that point, and that makes a huge difference for all the cows and their health. And I would assume enjoyment of life too. The bull calf, sexual breeding, or rather the bull calf, sexual development to breeding. The bull calf enters sexual development when he reaches 45% of his mature body weight at the beginning of his first winter. We're doing the guys now. Much like the heifer calf, 
whose reproductive tract and mammary glands develop during this period. The bull calf's testicles develop at this stage. His mother's milk ensures that he gains just enough weight to guarantee healthy sexual development. If he gains too much weight on a heavy grain diet or feed trial, for example, fat cells will deposit in his scrotum, insulating it and preventing it from regulating the temperature of his sperm, thereby causing infertility. Temperature regulation is the key to a bull's fertility. No matter how impressive his weight gains and scrotal circumference are or how well proportioned and masculine he may be, if fat deposits in his testicles, he will be subfertile or infertile. In addition, by preventing the accumulation of fat cells in the scrotum of young bulls, we guarantee that as adults they will be able to withstand summer heat without negative effects on their fertility during the fall breeding season. It's just that simple. This critical sexual development stage ends when a bull reaches 65% of his mature body weight the following spring. He can then gain weight rapidly without depositing fat cells in his scrotum and the seasonal filling and depleting of his fat reserves no longer affect his fertility. From apprentice to herd sire. In the wild, young bulls follow the older herd sires, play fighting with them to learn how to challenge dominance, read displays of aggression, and settle fights without serious injury and learning many breeding behaviors. The older bulls continue to serve as role models for the younger bulls until the youngsters mature enough to become serious threats to the herd sire's leadership. When that happens, the play fighting becomes serious and the younger bulls are chased out to the herd's periphery. The dominant herd sire breeds up to 90% of the cows in the herd. To accomplish this, he must learn to court his harem efficiently and to assert his dominance of the other, other bulls without risking serious injury to himself. In the wild, only a tiny fraction of dominance challenges between bulls result in physical fights. They are the exception, not the rule. Most disputes are avoided by carefully reading aggressive behaviors. A physical battle occurs only if the strength of two bulls is so evenly matched that they cannot settle their dominance disputes by simply gesturing. Young domestic bulls rarely grow up around older herd sires, so they have no opportunity to play fight with the older, stronger bulls or to observe the herd sires as their role models. This is the domestic ones. Instead, they are grouped together in feed pens and pastures where they can wrestle only with their playful aged mates. Because they are all so equally matched, they do not develop an ability to gauge each other's strength by behavioral displays alone. In fact, a good shoving match in a feed pen becomes the preferred method of settling a score just to counteract boredom. As a result, these young bulls learn that all dominance disputes are settled by physical conflict, resulting in far more serious injuries and expensive replacement bulls than is common in the wild. Letting our young bulls grow up on pasture among older bulls makes them better adjusted and gives them the skills necessary to resolve most dominant struggles through displays, not battles. <laughs> I remember that reading that last time and it's like, it's kind of an indictment of the, the school system. We're like putting all these kids together and you're like kind of keeping them children by keeping them all together in a way. I mean, it's not the same exactly and there's adults supervision, but it's just interesting because, you know, kids used to tend to grow up around adults and there are other kids to play with too, of course. But it's not like, you know, the parents were still around all the time. There was always groups of parents and, and that's what they're saying is that um, you learn kind of properly how to be an adult by living in the adult world not going to school and being told how to live in the adult world um hmm, interesting all right a note about creep feeding and bull feed trials this is a subsection creep feeding gives calves access to supplemental feed usually grain during winter by allowing them to crawl under a divider fence designed to prevent cows from reaching the creep feeding bunks this grain is typically fed cho uh, free choice to the calves in the hope that the extra feed will increase their weight gains. But because the grain is available, the calves typically stop competing with the adults for hay at the haystack or stop the effort to dig for grass under the snow. Instead, they attempt to gorge themselves on the grain, risking depositing fat in their developing mammary glands and scrotums at the expense of future milk production and fertility. Calves that are not creep-fed will experience compensatory gain on the lush grass following spring and will catch up to their creep-fed counterparts, but at a fraction of the cost per pound of weight gain. Right? Productivity, profit, high profit. Profit, uh, productivity is great. But see, we've, we've arrived at a, an animal that is slightly older by the end of spring, 
but they're both the same. And one of them, we spent all this time feeding a bunch of crap to get them there. And the other one, we didn't. And we just used the natural cycles, i.e. we did it a lot cheaper, which makes us make way more money for the same result. Really a better result because you have an animal that's also smart and healthy and well adjusted. Well, so bull calves are often fed at bull test stations after they are weaned or are simply placed on high grain diets at home in order to test their ability to gain on feed. These high grain rations typically coincide with their critical sexual development phase. Consequently, they risk forming fat cells in their scrotums, which negatively affects scrotal temperature and compromises their fertility for the remainder of their lives. With this feed practice, an extremely masculine bull whose growth is naturally slowed by his hormone production may be discounted by his feed trial results in favor of a less fertile bull that does not have an adequate hormone balance to limit his growth. There is more than one show champion bull that landed in a hamburger grinder without producing any calves because of infertility. High grain diet feed trial gains are not an indication of a bull's ability to produce low maintenance, highly profitable fertile offspring and, prof and profitable pasture gains on grass. Profitable pasture gains on grass. So how many cows per bull? This is the million dollar question because good pasture bulls are expensive and hard to find. There's no single right answer. The number of bulls you need for your herd depends on the size of your herd, the age of the bulls, the terrain they will be breeding on, and the size of the breeding pasture. When I was young, <laughs> our cattle herd spent its summers on range, dispersed over thousands of acres. At the time, we were calving in spring, so our bulls had to breed on summer range. With the cow herd so widely dispersed among dense brush and mountainous terrain, <clears throat> excuse me, we required a bull for every 25 cows to get the job done successfully. This bull to cow ratio worked well until we switched our cows from extensive rangeland management in which our herd was widely dispersed over hundreds of square miles of government range to an intensive pasture grazing program. The problem started after the herd was bunching, bunched into groups of 100 to 150 cows in flat treeless pastures no larger than 40 or 50 acres. The bulls kept getting hurt. At 25 cows per bull, the bulls were tripping over each other to reach the bulls. A bull could not breed in peace without a rival coming and knocking him off his job. When the cow to bull ratio was reduced to one bull for every 40 or 50 cows, and bulls of a wider range were included to reduce the number of dominance challenges, the injuries disappeared almost entirely and conception rates were not affected. So the ideal bull to cow ratio depends on the situation. How dispersed is the cow herd? How easy is it for bulls to travel between cows to check on their breeding readiness? For example, do they have to traverse bog, mud, thick brush, steep terrain, or flat meadow to reach them? How easy is it for bulls to see each other wooing cows in the pasture? Is their view obstructed by trees, or does low grass allow them a full view? Wow, we are, this is a freaking dating show we are enacting here for cows. As the bull's job becomes easier, Oh my God, this is amazing. As the bull's job becomes easier and the energy he must invest to find and breed each cow decreases, the competition between bulls increases and fewer bulls are necessary to accomplish the task. But what point are there simply not enough bulls to do the job? What is the greatest number of cows a bull can feasibly breed? I have heard a story of a bull that serviced 100 cows with a 90% conception rate. <laughs> I have heard tell of a bull cow that once fucked... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Once serviced 100 cows with 90% efficiency. Those are like Tom Brady numbers. No, I'm kidding. <coughs> In another trial, 70 cows per bull worked just as well as 20 cows per bull. I would not be comfortable with so few bulls, especially if each one is alone in a pasture. If the fertility of one of the bulls drops unexpectedly, or if one of the bulls is injured, it's prudent to have a backup. Backup bull. When the breeding season lasts only one or two cycles, even a single missed day of breeding has repercussions. So plan ahead. Match the number of bulls to your herd situation, then closely watch the bulls to determine whether they are getting the job done without too much fighting. By the way, if you're wondering, that's a lot of cows to one bull, right? Where are all those other bulls? Where'd all those other bulls go? Well, think about it. Cattle processing, the human role in the cattle year. Before planning the ideal cattle year on our calendars, we have to consider our involvement with 
and impact on the cattle herd through branding, castrating, dehorning, tagging, vaccinating, weaning, and processing on market days. The extreme stress of a hot iron pressed against the skin, needles stuck in the body, sorting, dust, mud, ice, crowded conditions, rough handling, and noise can wreak havoc on our livestock's demeanor and immune systems. Not only is it crucial to minimize the frequency and stress of these events, but we must also time them to coincide with the rhythm of nature's seasons in order to avoid negatively affecting the health, productivity, and profitability of the herd. Tagging. When we don't calve in sync with nature's ideal calving season, we have to tag calves to overcome the confusion created by crowded conditions, increased handling, and health problems. But in a scenario of summer calving in sync with nature's window of opportunity, the rules change. When calves are born on warm, dry, spacious pastures, they do not face the same challenges that require calving barns, treatment protocols, and constant handling. On the contrary, disturbing the new cow-calf pair while they are bonding in order to punch a tag through the calf's ear may cause the calf to bolt or to be abandoned before the bond is fully formed. This interruption in bonding results in orphans and runty calves that don't have their fill of colostrum, the immunity stuff. You could also be seriously injured by a protective cow, and it is unwise to cull cows for displaying strong mothering instincts because these very instincts are crucial to raising strong, healthy calves that are safe from predators. A cow cannot be expected to differentiate between a predator and you, particularly if you sneak up on her with a vicious snag tagging tool that makes her calf scream bloody murder. Adjust your management protocols and leave the rodeo to the arena. Right. Um, every mature cow should receive an ear tag when you select her to become part of your breeding herd. This allows you to record those that perform poorly during the winter or drought months so you can find them again after they have fattened on the lush spring grass and remove them from the herd. It also allows you to record cows that show poor mothering instincts, lose a calf to abortion or death, or have health or behavior issues so you can cull them at a later date. But you need to keep records only for problem animals that should be culled. These identify the animal why it should be culled and what veterinary treatment, if any, it received for shipping and marketing purposes. You should also keep a record of all ear tag numbers used in your cow herd so you don't hand out doubles by mistake. For the cow-calf producer who still feels it is necessary to tag cows, calves, there's an alternative that does not require the momentous effort in finding and tagging calves on pasture and does not disturb the crucial bonding process between a cow and her newborn. Simply tag every calf during calf processing day when branding, castrating, and all the other niceties happen. One additional procedure doesn't add significantly to a calf's stress level and requires little additional effort on your part. Afterward, you can pair the calf numbers to the cow numbers calf numbers to the cow numbers by spending a morning walking calmly among the herd in a small pasture to observe calves suckling. Doesn't that sound fun? The process is quite efficient. With the help of a friend who double checked the numbers, I paired 400 cow-calf pairs on two consecutive mornings, two to three hours each day, by waiting for each calf to suckle until we accounted for all the numbers. If the herd got restless, calf feeding time ended, or the herd settled down for a nap, we would simply stop and come back later. No stress, no near-death encounters with overprotective cows, and only a tiny fraction of the time investment of most tagging programs. Efficiency, baby. Subsection, a small subsection, entitled Tag Judicious, Judiciously. Tag Judicious, Doctor. Why are we tagging all these animals anyway? We need a record only for cattle that have been ill, are high maintenance, have had calving problems, or struggle with their fertility, in other words, cows and their daughters that have shown signs of weakness, to remove their genetics from the herd. Tag sick calves when you treat them so they can identify them later to prevent them from being sold as antibiotic-free beef and from being kept as breeding animals. All other cattle records are unnecessary. The cow will be more likely to remember which calf is hers if you do not interfere with the calf at calving time. And why create a record you'll never use? This is where a lot of people tend to panic. No records and no way to know which calf belongs to which cow? If you need to sort a cow from the herd and can't identify her calf immediately, the calf will become easy to identify by its behavior as soon as it gets hungry. Within a day, it will be desperately cruising around the paddock, calling to its mother and looking rather unsettled while the rest of the herd is quiet. If you remove a calf from the herd, it will be able to find its mother as soon as her udder fills with milk and she starts bawling for her calf to come and relieve the pressure. 
castrating, dehorning, branding, vaccinating, and parasite control. I have mixed feelings about horning. I think I just need to know more. Dehorning, rather. I need to um, to know more about it and if it's really necessary. But Julius Rochelle is, um, is pro dehorning. We'll talk about that. Processing days are tremendously stressful to cattle. Their weight gains are seriously disrupted for several days afterward. The stress depresses their immune systems briefly, and if this type of traumatic handling occurs too frequently, their cattle will become nervous and flighty. If possible, try to time processing activities so you can combine them into a single event. If you are already branding, for instance, a few more unpleasantries won't make the cow's day much worse. There's a picture above uh, using a dehorning iron to cauterize the base of the horn on a calf. Use a wire saw to saw off the horns of a yearling at the base of the skull. So they're tiny little horns. Mm. You can reduce recovery periods, stress, and processing related health consequences by carefully planning the, pr the processing day. Wait until the bond between mother and calf is well established and the calf is strong enough to handle the stress and old enough to receive all its vaccinations. Time the events so that the weather will be working on the calf's favor during the recovery period. Heat, cold, food shortage. Heat, cold, food shortage, flies, high humidity, and mud are all extra stresses that will compromise the calf's recovery and invite disease. Once you decide on a vaccination program, with the help of your veterinarian, to suit your management conditions and specific environment, the vaccination schedule will determine the earliest date you can process your calves. I'm just going to point out that I've um, been on YouTube before, and I've um, there was one guy in particular that I remember talking about how he did not do any, no um, vaccinations, no antibiotic, like no hormone. Like I don't think Julius is recommending added hormones if you can get away with it but it sounds like he's saying vaccination is a normal thing and anyway I'm not relating to this humans at all um, but the advantage that the guy on YouTube was saying is like you just create the most um, badass strongest herd when you do that right like some animals uh, will end up getting cold perhaps earlier as a result of not giving the medicine but over time you are going to have the strongest, most badass herd. So I guess I should just point out that this is one book and I haven't even read most of it before. The next chapter I haven't read ever. So that'll be into new territory. Um, so this is one book and the information is amazing and I love uh, it so far. And Julius Richel clearly knows his trade but it's not the only way to do things, and I'm sure he'd be the first to say that on every particular, you know, on every detail, right? So, and he talks about dehorning, and some people are, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. There's always, like, individual choices to be made, and I think it is valid. It is a valid choice not to vaccinate in the first place uh, your, your cow herd. Mm. So, right. Once you decide on a vaccination program with the help of your veterinarian to suit your management conditions and specific environment, the vaccination schedule will determine the earliest date you can process your calves. If you are uh, using parasite control measures to deal with warble fly, worms, or ticks, the life cycle of the parasites must be considered when selecting the processing date. For example, if you apply a warble fly pesticide, you should process your calves after the first fly killing frost and before the warble grubs start burrowing in their migration through the host's body. Gross. By waiting for a convenient processing day to handle the newborn calves for the first time, producers lose the option of dehorning with dehorning paste because the horns have already begun to grow. On processing day, stop the horns from growing further by cauterizing the base of the horn with a hot dehorning iron, which prevents blood from reaching the growing horn. The skin around the horn should turn a copper color and must form a complete circle around the horn, tight to where the horn emerges from the skull. This is far more painful than even the hot branding iron, but it does allow you to remove the horns at a young age instead of waiting until they have become large enough to cut off. Uh, if you wait until the calves are yearlings to dehorn them, the horns can be sawed off at the base of the skull using a wire saw. In most cases, if used correctly, the saw will cauterize the blood vessels to prevent bleeding, and the process will be relatively painless compared to dehorning with a hot iron. 
Nevertheless, because using a wire saw is a tedious and time-consuming task compared to dehorning with an iron, and the wire saw poses a much greater risk of serious injury to the animal if the horn is not removed correctly, I still prefer, prefer using the dehorning iron on calves at a young age, particularly if I must process a large number of cattle. Why dehorn? The feedlot industry, buyers of cattle that are feed, uh, the fed feed commodities in confined yard areas to supply the slaughterhouse industry with slaughter-ready cattle has set the standard for dehorning cattle to maximize feed bunk space, avoid goring, prevent meat losses to bruising, and safeguard livestock handlers. Although grass-finished animals may never see a feedlot, even direct-marketed animals will still be transported and handled in sorting facilities where horned animals can inflict serious bruising on one another. Even the regular social jostling of cattle on pasture will cause costly bruising discounts at the slaughterhouse if the cattle are not dehorned. When people unaccustomed to horns have to handle horned animals during transport at the slaughterhouse, their nervousness is transmitted to the animals, which increases livestock stress and affects meat tenderness. Dehorn for the sake of stress fee handling, for a comfortable rapport with your livestock transporters, auctioneers, and butchers, and to maximize, minimize bruised meat and do it even if your grass-finished natural beef animals will never see a feedlot. By not handling the calves at birth, you miss the opportunity to use a castration ring on your... So just back to that on dehorning, it's like... I'm not 100% sold on that. It sounds like there's a lot of processes involved um, that if you just change those processes, you know, you really might be able to, to do it right. I like the idea of bulls having horns, frankly, so I'd really prefer to protect that if possible but I also completely hear what he's saying and so you know um, what would actually be done in practice is is yet to be determined by not handling the calves at birth um, you miss the opportunity to use a castration ring on your bull calves so it's either back to the old-fashioned method of castrating with a scalpel or using the banding method, which is similar to using a castration ring except that it requires a larger tool and a sturdy, sturdy rubber band designed for older animals. I'm sorry that I have to talk about this. Ugh. There's photos, picture, drawings down here on the other page. Castration ring, pretty obvious. A banding method can be used to castrate an older bull calf. Ugh. I hate this must go through. Banding and ringing, even done at birth, are somewhat more of a health risk to the calves than castrating with a scalpel. The rubber band cuts off the circulation of the scrotum until the scrotum dies and falls off on its own. Before the sac falls off, however, it becomes an oxygen-deprived environment that is perfect for anaerobic um, bacteria such as tetan uh, tetanus and other clostridial diseases. The dying, festering, bloodless sac also becomes a fly magnet which brings additional bacteria to the wound. A surprising number of calves that are ringed at birth have a low infection, low level infection around their scrotum for weeks after the sac has fallen off. It puts an unnecessary strain on a calf's immune system and reduces its vigor and gains. Most important, castrating allows you to manage your heifers and steers as a single herd. Castrating with a scalpel does not leave a festering wound, and because there is no chance of a testicle slipping out, you avoid the risk of winding up with, a half, with half a bull capable of breeding out of season. Although it seems more invasive to castrate with a scalpel instead of a band or ring, the open wound heals immediately. Blood flows to the wound to clean the area and prevent infection. No anaerobic environment is created to attract bacteria, and the wound does not become a festering fly magnet. If you are unaccustomed to castrating calves with a scalpel, it is extremely important to have your veterinarian show you the correct procedure. A mistake here could easily cause a calf to bleed to death. The trick is timing the castration so the calves can immediately access plenty of fresh pasture free of mud, dust, and manure after the procedure so there is less chance for dirt and bacteria to get into their wounds. It's all like very technical and very practical, right? If they go back to a previously grazed pasture, the leftover manure piles will begin hatching fly larvae that will irritate a healing wound. It, is also, it also helps if the weather is warm and dry, but in northern climates it is advantageous to wait until the first full frost have killed the flies. A lush pasture provides the newly castrated calves with high quality nutrition that assists their recovery, and the grass will not irritate the calves' wounds as overly mature or seedy grass would. Castrating, it, uh, castrating makes it easier to produce a consistent meat product because the calf will be less prone to stressful dominance interactions and will not ride, try to breed, the other calves in a feedlot situation where space is cramped. 
Mm, you know how those feedlots can get sometimes. Although space is not a factor in a grass finishing scenario, the grass steer still gives you more f marketing flexibility because his meat does not toughen as quickly with age as that of a bull. Most important, castrating allows you to manage your heifers and steers as a single herd to maximize the grazing impact on the land and facilitate your grazing management. There is minimal riding among them because the constant supply of fresh grass and the open space keep their minds occupied with grazing. Until a bull calf is castrated, he experiences an extra growth boost from his testosterone. Thus, the longer you wait to castrate, the faster your bull calves will grow. But castrating becomes more troublesome and traumatic as the calf gets older. The best compromise is to castrate the bull calf at several months of age when you perform all your other processing activities. The brief time, oh boy, that is a bad day for the... <laughs> The brief time between calving and processing nevertheless provides a bit of a testosterone boost that you can uh, you avoid creating an additional stressful and time-consuming processing day. You will disrupt, disrupt the herd's weight gains only once, and your management will be kept as simple as possible. When calving in sync with nature's seasons, calf processing inevitably occurs sometime during fall, an ideal time for castrating. The weather has not yet turned ugly, and the grass is still lush, so the calves will recover quickly with minimal complications. So it's about doing it right. I mean, I I really suspect that there's just no way around castrating. Um, I mean, I'm sure there is, but it's just like it's it's sort of like the price for domestication. It's kind of how I would look at it. As awful as it is, these are domesticated animals, and in many ways, they're well. I might be speaking for them when I shouldn't, but it just creates, it, it sounds like it um, alleviates a lot of potential problems down the road um, based on this domesticated lifestyle. Weaning. In the conventional marketing system, we are accustomed to calving in spring and weaning in fall so we can take our calves to market and pay back our bank loans before the end of the fiscal year. A grass-based summer calving scenario requires a different marketing approach because the calves are still too young to wean and fall and are not big enough to be profitable. Instead, you can either sell the calves as stalkers, calves in the stage between weaning and the final pre-slaughter finishing phase that are between 350 and 850 pounds and are being grown on pasture the following spring when stalker prices are typically very strong, or you can take advantage of their compensatory gains yourself, graze them through the following summer, and sell them as 800 pound yearlings before the weanlings start to flood the fall market. You can also continue grazing. I'm sure we'll learn more about this. I'm, I'm still like, why, you know, this book is, is largely written for people who, you know, possibly already raise beef. And so he's saying like selling these things, why would you be selling them? Why don't you just grow them yourself and then sell them at the end? I'm sure there's reasons for that. Um, but also you could just not sell them at all, right? Um, you can also continue grazing the yearlings throughout the fall to grass finish them yourself if you develop your direct market for natural organic beef. There we go. Uh, see chapter 17 for an in-depth discussion about grass finishing cattle. I'm excited for that. No matter which market scenario you choose, if you are summer calving, the longer you wait to wean, the longer calves can supplement their diet with their mother's milk and the lower your cost per pound of milk, per, excuse me, per pound of gain. Milk is free as long as the cows have excess fat reserves to burn. Cows that forage through winter on last summer's pasture stockpile slowly reduce their milk production to compensate for the deteriorating grass quality and their compromised body condition. Often they will wean their calves to reduce the nutritional drain of lactation, so by the time spring arrives, many calves will already be weaned with none of the costly and dramatic separation stresses that normally accompany the process. The only reason to wean at all is to guarantee the cows enough time to regain their body condition prior to calving. If a cow's body condition allows it, waiting until as late as a month and a half before calving will still give the cow enough time to recover. Weaning is also a powerful tool to manage BCS during winter. The body cow, the body score index. Um, if the cows lose weight too quickly, you can wean their calves before you have to resort to feeding expensive supplements. As you observe cows beginning to lose condition, you can also wean individual cows that are nutritionally stressed. This is best done by removing the cow from the herd. The calf remains in the relative security of the herd. Uh, 
So you remove the cow from the herd, the mom. The calf remains in the relative security of the herd where it can continue to steal milk from other cows. Its environment is unchanged except for the absence of its mother. This is far less stressful than the calf for the calf than removal and makes it makes sorting much easier. Excuse me. The wean cow, now separated, can receive nutritional supplements or be culled without having to supplement the entire cow herd. Weaning should be time to provide the calf with the most favorable weather and nutritional nutrition during the transition stage so that weaning stress does not result in disease, reduced weight gain, and so forth. If the cow's BCS allows you to wait until spring, the best time to wean is just as the fresh grass starts to make its appearance at the end of the long winter. The cow still has plenty of time to recover her BCS, and the calf will be weaned onto fresh, lush grass shoots during mild winter, mild weather rather. Uh, lush grass during, during the mild weather. Weaning across an electric fence is the most stress-free method. It virtually eliminates all the bawling, broken fences, sleepless nights, and disease pressure that are typically follows the process. Calf gains will be hardly, hardly be interrupted and may not be affected at all. The cows are separated from the calves by a two or three strand electric fence that divides the pasture. As long as the two groups can see, smell, and hear one another, and if they have lots of fence line along which to socialize without actually being able to suckle, separation anxiety is kept to a minimum. The first day, both will spend a great deal of time pacing the dividing fence. By the second day, both sides will begin to graze further and farther from the fence, and as early as four days later, the calves can be quietly moved out of sight of the cows. It really can be this easy. Marketing grass-fed cattle. Although the specifics of marketing grass-fed cattle are discussed in much greater detail in chapter 15, marketing options, market options in chapter 17, grass-finished beef, this discussion of the cattle year on grass would not be complete without addressing how the timing of our marketing strategies can be molded to take advantage of the seasonal rhythms of a natural cattle year on grass and identifying the marketing opportunities created by calving in sync with nature's seasons. Most producers have an excess of grass during summer when the herd supply cannot keep up with the fast growth. Much of the grass matures, slows in growth, and loses nutritional value by late summer. By grazing your own calves as stalkers through summer, each calf produces more beef before you sell it. Thus it takes fewer cows to produce the same number of pounds of beef per acre of grass. Efficiency, efficiency, profitability. Fewer calves, fewer cows means fewer mouths to feed through winter, but then the herd's grass consumption virtually doubles during summer when grass is plentiful because you continue to graze the stalkers through the summer months instead of selling them directly after weaning as most conventional production and marketing systems do. So you hold on to them and you use them. They're like the cows are the employees, remember that? The best time to wean is just as the fresh grass starts to make its appearance at the end of the long winter. The increased grass consumption caused by retaining your stalkers during the summer allows you to take advantage of the summer grass excesses. But by selling the stalkers in the early fall uh, or slaughtering grass finished animals in the late fall, you reduce your herd's grass consumption significantly in the winter. Consequently, during the winter months, the grass consumption of the remaining cows and their very young calves, which consume only a small amount of grass at this time, coincides with the significantly reduced availability of forage. In addition, you can take advantage of wintering the calves, calves in the cow's milk, then capitalize on the calves compensatory gain when spring grass arrives. This allows you to produce beef at a much lower cost per pound than most other producers. By late summer, just as grass growth is slowing, the stalkers reach an ideal weight to sell before the fall rush of weanlings starts to drive down fall auction prices. Or you can continue on to grass finish and direct market your steers and cull heifers, which will be ready for slaughter at the end of fall. If you grass finish, you'll require even fewer cows to produce the same number of pounds of beef per acre, which further reduces your production costs. Yeah, so let's do it. Grass finish, baby. Many producers overlook the opportunities presented by their open and coal cows. The standard thinking is that it is best to sell opens, cows that failed to conceive during the breeding season, and culls, high maintenance cows, cows with poor genetics, sickly or mean cows, and so forth, that you must remove from the herd regardless of whether they are pregnant, as soon as possible because it costs money to feed them. Their low price per pound at auction supports the misconception that cutters, a term used for coals and opens that are considered too old or of too poor quality to use for all the prime cuts and which are thus ground in a hamburger by the butcher, do not have much value. 
In a summer calving scenario, however, rather than immediately selling your opens and coals just before the grass flush starts, you can fatten them on the spring grass to flush to take advantage of their compensatory gains before they are sold. They can gain weight far more efficiently than stock or cattle because they are neither lactating nor growing. If a cow's BCS goes from 5 to 7 in a month, she may well add 150 to 200 pounds to her market weight before you sell her. Even at cutter prices, this is a phenomenal increase in your profitability and means that your cutter cows will rival even your best stalkers in net value. It also allows you to begin your direct marketing season much earlier because you op because young open and coal cows can be direct marketed by the cut and even the older cutter cows can be direct marketed as hamburger for the summer barbecue season. Damn. We're thinking ahead, right? We're planning. Moving the calving season. This chapter is nearly done. There are many production and marketing challenge advantages to a natural grass-based production system, but they can be attained only if the calving season is in sync with nature's seasonal rhythm. The calving date is the most crucial building block that makes possible the low-cost, high-profit grass-based enterprise. Unfortunately, moving the calving season from early spring or late winter to early summer involves missing a year's income because the calves are not sold as weanlings in fall but are held over into the next fiscal year. I don't know an easy way around this. The cautious approach would be to switch the herd slowly, to have two herds and make the transition gradually over a number of years. Theoretically, this may sound more attractive, but this approach is a financial and management nightmare because each system demands different management strategies, calving needs, equipment, and grazing programs. Each herd will impede the other's smooth operation, and you will be stretched so thin, both financially and mentally, that you will not be able to realize the full benefits of your new system. The calving date is the most crucial building block that makes possible the low-cost, high-profit, grass-based enterprise. None of the benefits of winter grazing, stress-free calving, and reduced inputs is possible with an out-of-season herd. Until the entire herd is switched to summer calving, you can't even sell your expensive forage and feeding equipment to pay for infrastructure changes, for example, electric fences and water sites, necessary to take full advantage of the benefits of summer calving. And what of the maintenance costs? Do you start rebuilding feed bunks and replacing forage equipment for only half the cow herd, knowing that these investments will be obsolete as soon as you complete the transition? <coughs> Excuse me. The best approach is to plan the transition all the way through to its completion before changing anything, and then to make the transition as quickly as possible, preferably in one fell swoop. This way, you can give your new production system your full attention without being distracted by a remaining out-of-season herd. You will start enjoying the benefits and results of a single summer calving herd much sooner, allowing you to gain confidence quickly. By committing yourself fully, you can sell off a great deal of equipment such as feeding and grain handling equipment that is no longer necessary or applicable to your new production system. For example, you'll be able to reduce to a bare minimum or sell altogether your forage making lineup. This will give you the financial cushion to survive a year without income until your first set of yearlings is ready for sale. It also allows you to make new investments in grazing infrastructure. Fall calving producers who need to move their herds to an earlier calving date can adjust their breeding season ahead a little each year until the cows reach their ideal calving date instead of delaying their entire breeding season for many months. Synchronizing the herd with the presence of a bull incapable of breeding or by short duration weaning just prior to breeding will help improve conception rates during the transition period. The closer you get to the ideal early summer calving season, the more nature will support the change with cows coming into estrus soon after calving. Moving the breeding season ahead by three weeks to a month each year is quite safe in a 42 breeding cycle, 42 day breeding cycle because the cow's recovery period will be shortened by only one estrus cycle. Some cows undoubtedly will not get rebred, but you can take comfort in knowing that these are the less fertile, high maintenance animals that you'll want to cull to improve your herd's genetics. So it sounds like during this transition period, you should really be keeping an eye and, and learning about your herd to see who can get through this uh, change the best, because you know those are the strongest animals. The Julian calendar, introduced by, this is the very end. Oh my God, one tiny little subsection. I mean, we are done with this chapter. I am done reading, my God, this is long. 
The Julian calendar, introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BCE to match the length of the solar year and divide the year into roughly equal months. The 365-day Julian calendar is a wonderful tool to help you plan your calving and breeding dates. See page 298. We'll get there eventually. Each day of each month corresponds to a day on the 365-day Julian calendar, which allows you to quickly calculate when to turn out your bulls based on when you want to calve and vice versa. In chapter 23, we'll find a full Julian calendar and instructions on how to use it, along with complete guidelines on how to plan your ideal cattle year. So that's the end of chapter 3, the cattle year. It's like this. And keep in mind that for many of these animals, the year is all they have. And it is our job as producers of grass-fed cattle to make it a great year for them. And ultimately, we're turning the natural cycles on for these animals and giving them a, a life which to them has meaning. It's kind of unbelievable to me that we, you know, we, I mean, I, it is believable. We, there were reasons for it and the style of feeding. And, you know, he mentioned how uh, a long time ago um, in the Middle Ages, people would build their houses on top of the cows. So basically, they're, you know, in the cold areas, they were always keeping their cows in barns, which they're feeding them hay and all that sort of stuff. It created all these different cycles. But this is recreating what is in nature the cycle of the cattle year. And it's all around breeding and the seasons and the timings of food. And you can use all these things. We've already learned so much, right? You know so much more than the average person on how to raise a cow, right? You're like, well, do you want to have your cow give birth in winter? No, you don't. That's not natural. It's not wild. And it creates problems. And it literally makes the mother's less motherly because they're not in the right frame of mind they're not in the right part of the cycle for that and so what we're doing is is giving them their lives back taking these cows out of these factory farms and giving them lives of joy and meaning again and providing food for the humans. All right, well, that was a long chapter three. I don't think they're always gonna be that long. Hopefully we'll mostly be able to do them in one mm -hmm. section, but this is the end of section two of chapter three in grass-fed cattle, how to produce and market natural beef. Have a great rest of your day.